Okay, so chapter 17 drops into the resource market. So pretty much most of the semester we've been hanging out in what we call the output market, the final goods and services, the chicken wings, the beer, the pizza, all that stuff. And so now we're going to hang out for a while in this chapter in the resource market. All right, so that's where we're at. One of the first things to highlight is that the roles are reversed. So the resource market, we can look at our players, households. Households are the suppliers. Why are households characterized to be the suppliers rather than businesses? What's kind of our basic fundamentals of this concept of the circular flow that makes them the supply curve? They're supplying labor, yes, that's one of the big ones. What else? So labor's a big one. We'll spend a lot of time thinking about the labor market. <coughs> what other stuff? So households own labor. And labor is paid for a wage or a salary. But we'll talk a lot about the wage rate per hour. What else do they own? Land, good. So we got households own land. And they might be paid rent on the land or a price for coal or a price per acre or uh, price per weight of gold or something like that. Okay, what else? Capital. Wait a second, doesn't the business own the capital? Households have capital too, and households own some, or businesses own some. What is the connection there for capital? I just kind of want to link this back. In this class, I'm trying to maintain focus that the world is really about these people over here. This world's just an adaptation of these people doing what's best for themselves, right? This is the economy. It's all about people trying to make themselves happy as possible, whatever they find themselves to make the, uh, in what way they make themselves happy, right? The pursuit of happiness. So, why do we allow businesses to own capital? Or do they own capital? What is capital? It's a resource. What is it more specifically? Give me some examples of capital. Money! Money. <laughs> uh, sorry, Alex. That's the worst wrong answer I've heard in a long time. Money is just... Day one, day one, I tried to flush. I really tried to flush money down the toilet. And I'm really glad you brought it up, Alex. And I... I uh, might even give you an extra credit point since I'm going to make fun of you, but not capital. Money is just not capital. Money is sometimes said to be capital in other classes and in other ways, but it's not capital in economics class. What is capital? Factories. Factories. What else? Computers. Computers. What else? Machines. Shovels pencils, things that make other things, right? So households own capital. Now to get back to my question, what's the connection of capital ownership back over here? I said 
can businesses own capital? Can businesses own computers? Well, sure they can. But how do we tie that back over here? What's true about business ownership? Ran by people and more strongly owned by people, right? So businesses are owned by people. Businesses just don't exist all by themselves, some sort of thing that we just kind of started off and no, there's no more human beings. For every business, there is a human being associated with that business in some way, shape, or form, whether in the form of, in a, in a sole proprietorship, you've got the single owner is the person that lives over here. Uh, in the case of major corporations, there are shareholders. They all live over here in one of these things during the day, right? So with every business entity or business organization, there's a human being associated with it that owns a, a cut of that. They own some fraction of ownership or it may be the whole thing in its entirety. And so ultimately, humans own the capital. Might be using the, the business as a vehicle of that ownership, but it's ultimately coming back to some human beings over here. All right, and so, <clears throat> Capital is paid typically rent or the rental rate. If we think about it per hour, of course, there can be a, a price of capital in different ways too. But some of the words we'll use here is kind of the rental rate. We use the wage for labor, maybe the price of land or the price per acre or the rent of land, the price per acre. All right, and then finally, we've got the entrepreneurship owns entrepreneurship, which is really a weird thing to look at. Who is the entrepreneur? What does he or she do? What is entrepreneurial activities? There's just all, it's kind of a, a nebulous thing. Uh, but ultimately, the entrepreneur takes on some risk and gets paid profit. I guess a simple way to boil it down. <clears throat> and I might even add paid profit, somehow maybe make a notation here that it's not certain. Maybe there's nothing certain in life, but um, kind of in a, in a pure way, the entrepreneur, the, the return to entrepreneurship is, doesn't have a contract associated like your job does. I'm gonna pay you $10 an hour, you put in 10 hours, you get 10, you know, you get 100 bucks. Uh, but profit's a little bit different. There's some sort of risk associated with it. Okay, so that is our tie back to the households being pretty important as the supplier of resources. We assume that Households own all of the resources in the economy, and therefore they are supplying them to businesses uh, during the day in order to generate income. All right, so where does that leave us in this world then? Let's go ahead and use labor since we'll be thinking about that one quite a bit. So here we've got the quantity of labor on the horizontal axis, and maybe we've got the, the wage rate up on the vertical axis. And the supply curve then comes to us in the form of households. So these are households supplying that resource. And the demand comes from businesses. So the demand curve is made up of firms or businesses that are trying to maximize profit. So household, back to the <coughs> previous chapters where we spent time on the consumer, the household's out there to maximize utility. Firms are out to maximize profit. It's kind of good to keep their roles off the top of your head as you, as you dive into these details. The interaction between the two would give you this little spot where the two lines cross. Why 
wouldn't it be higher? So if the wage here ends up being $10 an hour in this particular market, why wouldn't it be higher? I mean, geez, maybe we think that they deserve $15 an hour. Why would it not be 15 Okay, good. So there's other people, so there's multiple people in the picture, right? And even though we might all like to have more pay rather than less pay, um, the bottom line is at a higher wage of 15, the quantity supplied would be greater than the quantity demanded. And what would we call that? A surplus. And maybe more specifically in the labor market, what would you call that? Unemployment. Right? So unemployment. We got more people wanting to work than what uh, businesses are willing to hire at that pay. Now assuming that there's not minimum wage that's restricting the pay to go down, how the market would naturally adjust is that um, there's people out here that are willing to pay. So if, if we look at the shortage, the short side of the market always wins. So if there's 100 workers being demanded, the quantity demanded is 100 workers, and the quantity <coughs> supplied is 250, there's a whole bunch of people out there. And more specifically, there's people here that are willing to work for only $7. There's somebody else over here that's willing to work for 8 There's somebody else that's willing to work for 9 And so these two parties are going to start um, negotiating with each other. The people who are unemployed might approach an employer and says, I know you normally pay 15, but I'm really looking for work. Uh, let me start here. Let me, give me a chance. Give me a shot. And I'll, I'll, I'll work for $8 an hour if you let me get in the door and prove myself, and then you can give me a wage. Right? So you can kind of see the, the market forces through voluntary exchange are going to drive the wage down to this equilibrium level of Ten dollars an hour, where we have, and again, I'm just making up some numbers here. Two hundred and ten people working in equilibrium. All right, so let me pose a question for you. I, I've uh, I've done a little bit of research on some numbers that we'll get to share in a variety of ways here. But at, at uh, if you go look at universities, and I looked at the data at Iowa State, we found that uh, econ professors are paid quite a bit more than English professors. So why do econ profs get paid more on average than English professors. Because the American capitalist is imperative. Because American capitalist what? Because the American capitalist is imperative. Imperative, what's that? Okay. Yeah, so there could be some, some cultural influences there. Okay, other thoughts? They know how the graph works. What's that? They know how the graph works. They know how the graph works. That, that's possible too. Yeah, there might be something with the, with the uh, behavior there. Um, well, let, let me push you a little bit harder. Does, does the econ professor work longer hours at this university? So. They probably work similar hours. <clears throat> um, is the education just a lot more in terms of the degree, master's degree, PhD? Probably at a larger institution, they both have PhDs, right? So they got kind of equal education. So both have PhDs. 
Are their daily activities during their similar hours that they put in much different? The econ professor working at a university. Not really. I mean, both teach. So they're going to spend some time teaching some classes. Um, both probably pursue some research interests at larger institutions, not as much here at Ottawa University. Both teach, both research, both do some committee work. We always have to do committee type stuff and serve on this and that. Go to uh, meetings, faculty meetings, that sort of thing. So we got similarly educated, similar hours, similar work during the day. And this was a while back. I haven't looked at this data. So this was probably back in 2000. So in uh, 2009, I suppose it was. In 2009, at Iowa State University, where I used to be at, uh, we had the average uh, econ pay at about 105,000. And the average English professor pay at Oh, I think it was 60,000. Both of them work for a state university, I might add, too, right? The employer's the same. So, similar hours, similar degrees, similar duties. Same employer, why would we see a $45,000 a year difference? Caleb? Okay, higher supply of English professors, that, that's possible. There could be something there with the numbers. Lower demand. Okay, so is there a smaller demand? Um, I don't know, I guess it depends on how you characterize it, but do you think teaching English classes at a, at a major university versus teaching econ classes, that there'd actually be more econ classes than English classes? Or would you expect them to be about the same? Or, or maybe even more, yeah. English is kind of across the board. So the demand, on the demand side, I think it might even give a tilt to English, okay? What else, I saw a few other hands up. Okay, but that would tend to drive up their pay, I think, right? If there was an increase in demand. <coughs> if there was an increase in demand because of the number of classes the university had to fulfill that many. Jason? It's probably harder to find English classes than English right? Why? I'd agree. Why would it be a little bit harder to find one? Because they can make more money doing something else. That's right. Right? So what would you be doing if you weren't doing what you're doing? Does that sound like something we covered way back in chapter two? Good old opportunity costs. Right. So I had a good friend that, was, uh, that I played volleyball with and stuff that was an English professor. And so I used to have this discussion with them. And I'm like, what would you do if you weren't doing? And I never got a good answer from them. So. It was just kind of tough. If, you're, if you've got a PhD in English, uh, you don't need a PhD. You can go work for a corporation, but the corporation would be probably fine with a master's degree in English or something, too. So really, to push yourself to the PhD level in English, you're pretty much at a university doing stuff. And again, you might have some opportunities. That doesn't necessarily take away from the opportunities you might have doing some writing um, at, a, at a corporation or something. But even then, this is maybe closer to the type of pay you might be at that sort of thing. Whereas the economist might have opportunities into the higher six figures, right? 
And so this is actually a cut in pay for the economists to come and work at the university. But the hours, the flexibility, working with students, you know, there's a lot of other perks to the job that might be a compensating differential, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so higher opportunity costs is the bottom line. ISU isn't just doing it for fun. Is ISU likely paying the least amount possible to get good professors? Yeah. They're, assuming they are, now again, we gotta be careful with the word profit here, but at a state university or a place like Ottawa University that's non-profit, are they minimizing expenditure? Or are, they, are they trying to maximize profit or whatever their objective is? Sure. So they're gonna try to induce people for the lowest pay possible, but still maintaining a level of quality. And so in order to do that, this is closer to the number that you need to do to induce people away from the private sector because their opportunities are higher. All right, so econ prof has a higher opportunity cost. So could be working in the private sector for much more. <coughs> so the same is true for English, the same is true for any discipline. What are their opportunities? How can I induce that person to come work for me? That drives a pretty big wedge here because it's not any of this stuff. Right? This stuff is all about the same, so it really comes down to opportunity cost driving that result. <coughs> all right, any questions there? Comments so far? All right, so if we, I think I'll leave that one up there. If we look at the supply curve, we can make a distinction between what opportunity cost is and what economic rent is. So in general, uh, total pay can be decomposed into uh, two parts. So if we just draw a supply curve, a labor supply curve, and if somebody is currently the pay for, um, oh, let's see, what's a nurse, anybody want to stab, take a stab at a nurse um, hourly pay? Yeah, 60,000 sounds about good on average. Hourly, I've heard anywhere from, yeah, yeah, up, up a ways. So let's just pick a number. Let's just say $30 an hour. Maybe we're looking at nursing. And by offering an average pay of $30 an hour, we get a certain number of hours of work, 2,000 hours of work, or 2,000 nurses, Sometimes we use hours on the horizontal axis. Sometimes we could be measuring human beings, like the number of nurses, right? So either way, we'll just, gonna, we'll just kinda leave it generic for this discussion. So we're gonna decompose this into two parts. So for the thousandth hour, what does this reflect? Give me an interpretation of what I just drew, this point, let's call it point A, if you will. So suppose that the market pay, so I guess I better be a little, let's say that this is the market pay, $30 an hour. Talk to me about 
point A and that level of supply. Someone working part time. Uh, part or full? You tell me the story of what you want to say. If this is 2,000 nurses, maybe you could, uh, let's talk in terms of quantity of nurses. So I Okay, good. Uh, only a thousand nurses are willing to work at fifteen dollars. I like that. Anybody want to? add? I think you could add on to that. Not necessarily sorry, but that was solid. Okay. Uh, be careful, but you're getting close. Good. The opportunity cost of the thousandth nurse, that extra nurse, the thousandth nurse was fifteen dollars. So this vertical height here for the thousandth nurse represents the opportunity cost. Remember the supply curve is the marginal cost curve. So this is kind of like opportunity cost now. It's the amount of money that's required to direct another unit of a resource into its present use. The flip way of saying that is if I want to induce one more nurse to come work for us, the thousand and one nurse has a little bit higher cost. And so you're going to have to keep jacking up the pay the more nurses you want to hire. Right? So the opportunity cost area ends up being this little squiggle area. Kind of similar to when we did producer surplus and consumer <coughs> surplus, but this is a little different here. This reflects the opportunity cost of the resource. So Down to the zero, yes. Yep, the very first, uh, if you guys drew it with a little bit of a uh, intercept and it right be to the first nurse had that amount. So it's a little trapezoidal potentially, not just a triangle. The thousandth nurse though was paid how much? Fifteen? Well, are we still paying are we still paying at the actual market is at thirty? The actual market's at thirty. All right, so the concept here is kind of similar to what we saw in perfect competition, being a price taker or that sort of thing. The market needs, the market in general, all the hospitals, all the clinics, all the medical care, they need 2,000 nurses. And in order to induce a couple thousand people to get into the nursing industry, pay needs to be up at 30. The thousandth nurse was willing to do it for 15, but actually gets paid 30 giving this $15 of economic rent. Not profit, this is the word we use for resource market, economic rent. And the same is true for all nurses. If we pick them off one by one in a marginal fashion, Nurses down here were willing to work for $5 an hour. They're getting paid $30. They're getting $25 worth of, now, unlikely that they'd be willing to do it. Although in the medical industry, that might be possible that we have some people that just like to help other people and they're good at uh, providing health care services. We might have some folks that would be um, down at a fairly low wage rate. And so they get a lot of economic rent. They still get paid $30. Everybody gets paid $30. But if we start thinking about this, balance between a payment above and beyond what you need to get versus what you're actually getting, economic rent. All right, so. So economic rent is a payment to a factor of production, a resource. But we also use that word. I guess I kind of want to start to get you comfortable with using those interchangeably. A payment to a factor of production or a resource that is 
in excess of the minimum amount required, which is parentheses the opportunity cost. A couple basketball players, we got some football players too. Um, highest paid NFL athlete. Let's throw some numbers out to me. Currently on today's market, who's the highest paid NFL athlete? Four to five million per year. Rogers. I know they got longer term contracts. Rogers is getting like 14 a year. 14 a year, wow. Okay, so Aaron Rodgers, fourteen million a year for the Green Bay Packers. Anybody else got other names? I mean, you got Peyton Manning, uh, Drew Brees is up there. All right, you can pick your sport, right? We got LeBron James. We got you know, you can go down the list. What is their breakdown on pay? What is their breakdown on pay? Those professional athletes are they? Get with a with a fourteen million dollar contract, Aaron Rodgers. Is that a lot of economic rent or a lot of opportunity cost? A lot of economic rent, right? So, what would Rodgers be doing if he wasn't playing in the NFL? Now, if we change that to saying, what if he wasn't doing if he was playing for the Green Bay Packers? Does he have some other alternatives? Yeah. Are there a couple NFL teams that wouldn't mind picking up Rodgers? and maybe matching his salary, right? So that's not what we're talking about here. What if he wasn't playing NFL football? What would Rodgers be doing? Coaching, maybe? Highest paid coach in the NFL makes? I'm not even sure on that one. At least four to five million? But that's quite a cut in pay, right, if Rodgers goes into coaching. And we're still in the NFL. What if we get Rodgers out of the NFL altogether? What would Rodgers be doing? Car salesman. Car salesman. Maybe he'd be good at that. Doing some commercials. He can be riding the coattails of his fame. That, that, that'll wear out eventually, too. All, all athletes can do that. O.J. Simpson was really good at, uh, at advertising the Avis, uh, what was it, Avis rental car? No, Hertz. Advertising Subway. Hertz. And, yeah, he's gotten into a few things. But... All of that stuff tends to fade over time. You know, most of his pay is economic rent. So if we look at a couple extreme cases where a supply curve looks like this and a supply curve looks like this, a perfectly elastic supply and a perfectly inelastic supply, my question to you is which one's Aaron Rodgers? Which one's Aaron Rodgers? The left one, elastic. You think it's the right? All right, here's a good way to, to remember it. Pull out your golf club during a test. And as I start to make the, whoa, 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 lost the golf club. Economic crash. As I start to make the, uh, the supply curve more inelastic, what happens to the green area? It's increasing, right? right? And as I go this way, the red area is increasing. All right, so there's your answer. So Aaron Rodgers is off to the right here, along with most other professional athletes. Um, so here we've got the all economic rent. If he's at 14 trillion, I'll just put a 14 there if you guys want to put a million or, or 14 dollars. But this is all economic rent for the most part, and over here, 
when we pay, when we can hire pretty much as many workers as we need to at, uh, let's say, $8 an hour, then people don't have a lot of other opportunities, right? So this is a lot of times low to no skill labor. Low, no skill labor. Would you say Aaron Rodgers has some skills? Is he medium skilled? Or skills are off the chart, right? So this starts to make sense here, right? I mean, how many Aaron Rodgers with his accuracy, blah, 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 perception of the field? There's maybe, there's not even that many other NFL quarterbacks with that type of thing, right? So we're talking five human beings that are roaming the earth with that type of skill set, right? So these are, these tend to be highly, very highly skilled. Very highly skilled people tend to get paid a lot of economic rent. Not always obnoxious 14 million type of numbers, um, but the more skill you have, the higher uh, you might find in the economic rent category. The more specialized your skills are, the more they will be valued um, in the labor market because the supply of people with higher skills is a lot less. What's that? Unless you're an English professor. Unless you're an English professor, which 60,000 is not bad, 60, 65, right? Okay, so that gives us a little bit of the lay of the land for the supply curve. And now let's look at the, at the businesses. So what about demand? What about demand? My black is I lose traction here. So for the demand curve, what I'd like to do is ask you a question. Does this make sense? A firm should hire an additional an additional worker A firm should hire additional worker if the revenue generated by adding that worker is at least as much as the additional cost. associated with that worker. Does that sound like a wise thing to do, given our what we've learned in econ class? Yeah, it probably should. Good. If it sounds familiar, then you're starting to get things, right? A firm should hire an additional worker if the revenue generated by adding that worker is at least as much as the cost associated with that worker. Why does that make sense given what our assumptions are of the model? You might not agree with the statement. You say, oh, well, if they're nice, if they're a good fit, blah, 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 whatever. But how does this fit in? with our assumptions of the firm. They want to maximize profit, right? So everything's done at the margin. Should I do this? Should I do that? What, if, what are the costs associated with doing this? What are the revenues? What are the benefits associated with doing this? That's all this is, is a marginal 
analysis of that additional worker. Okay, so our profit, our, our condition for the firm that's consistent with profit maximization is to, maybe I'll write it up here, higher L star, the optimal amount of labor, higher L star, that quantity, produce the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit just equal to the cost of the last unit. Now we're going to hire L star where the value of the marginal product equals the marginal resource cost. Marginal resource cost. I'm going to write it out. So value of the marginal product is the BMP. We talked about the restaurant flipping burgers. We kind of did this during that exercise. I had another person. That person allows me to flip more hamburgers. Those hamburgers can be sold for a certain amount. That's the value of their marginal product. So the value of the marginal product is equal to the marginal revenue times the marginal product. We're combining two marginal things that we did before to get the value of the marginal product. So MR is just like it was in chapter 11, uh, 12. Marginal revenue is the revenue generated by an extra burger. If you're in a perfectly competitive market, that's the price of the burger. If you sell the burger for two bucks, then that's the revenue generated by an extra burger, right? The marginal revenue of an extra unit of production. More formally, we have the change in total revenue over the change in Q. That was our formula for marginal revenue. Marginal product we saw in chapter 11, that is the change in total product, the change in total product from extra person. This was a physical thing. I hire an extra person, I get so much more product. So it's the change in Q over the change in L. Now I set you up to do a formula, and you didn't even know I was sneaking this in here. So the value of the marginal product, marginal revenue times marginal product, the change in Q's kind of cancel. You can lightly put a little X through them. It's the revenue generated from an additional unit of labor, which is what we just said. All right, that is the beginning of chapter 18, so that's where we're at.